The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Let it snow, let it snow, or let it hail, I guess. Cut with the snow, please. <laughs> Season's greetings. My name is Anaya Balcom, and I will be your host for today's segment of BronxNet Open 2.0. It is finally that time of the year where joy and laughter fills the air. Have you ever wanted to get into the holiday spirit but couldn't figure out how? Well, today I will be giving you the inside scoop on the best places to visit in NYC to embrace the holiday season. If you are looking for an amazing light show mixed with some serious city ambiance, look no further than the Saks Fifth Light Show. The array of bright lights blended with some serious tunes makes for a night that will have you feeling all of the holiday vibes. Now, if you are looking for a great way to work up an appetite after the enchanting light show, stop by Rockefeller Center to slide and glide on the ice at their ice skating rink. Between the lights and the lit Rockefeller tree, it will have you feeling like you're in a scene right out of the movie Elf. Now, if you're planning on just casually walking in the city, I advise you to casually walk yourself over to 6th Avenue to anything but typical ornaments. Now try putting these ornaments on your tree. These larger than life ornaments will make for a great background for your next Christmas card or Insta post. You can also walk right across the street to Radio City Music Hall. Here, you will be able to take part in the timeless tradition of witnessing the Radio City Christmas Spectacular, home to the famous Rockettes. If you find yourself to be on the crafty side, I suggest you stop by the Jewish Children's Museum located in Brooklyn to take part in a Hanukkah-themed crafting experience. Also, if you decide you would like to decorate something you can eat, stop by the Jewish Children's Museum's Donut Bar for the chance to decorate your festive Hanukkah tree, the perfect way to get into the spirit and fill your belly. Are you looking for a one-stop shop for all of the fun and celebration that Hanukkah has to offer? Well, do I have the place for you? Stop by the Hanukkah Fun House located in NYC on 419 East 77th Street. If the large ornaments and light shows aren't enough to leave you in awe, then I suggest you stop by the accumulation of Hanukkah lamps located on 5th Avenue on the Upper East Side. Here, you will see more than 80 lamps representing a broad and rich history. To those of you who look for the art in life, check out the Kwanzaa Regeneration Celebration at the Apollo Theater on December 26th. Prepare yourself for a night of influential and powerful music mixed with beautiful modern and African dance. Come together in unity to celebrate Kwanzaa with the lighting of the seven principles at Linden Studios located in Queens. This experience will be met with artful dance performances, amazing foods, gifts, and so much more. Lastly, if you're looking to celebrate Kwanzaa this weekend, take a ride over to the East Harlem Tutorial Program. From two to 6 p.m., you will be enriched in all things Kwanzaa, from Kwanzaa Jeopardy to karaoke and a plethora of other exciting activities and experiences. Well, that's all I have for today's NYC holiday extravaganza, but stay tuned for a DIY guide to making a candle holder, better known as a Kanara for Kwanzaa. Have you ever wanted to create something to celebrate Kwanzaa but didn't know what to do? Well, today's your lucky day. In the following clips, I, along with the help of my friends, Safia and Sydney, will be demonstrating how to make a Kanara, also known as a candle holder for Kwanzaa. Without further ado, let's get into the video. In order to take part in this lovely experience, you will first need supplies. This craft calls for 
glue, red, black, and green construction paper, brown paint, a paintbrush, an egg carton, and scissors. Once you have gathered your materials, start to paint your egg carton brown. While it is drying, you can start to cut out your candles using the red, black, and green construction paper. Make sure to have three red strips, one black strip, and three green strips. Once you have completed that task, you can start to make your flame. At this point, you will take the yellow construction paper and cut out a piece of paper in the shape of a flame. Next, you will take the orange paper and cut out a small triangle. Now, you will glue the orange triangle onto the yellow flame. You will repeat this step until you have enough flames for all seven candles. While you are letting the glue dry on the flames, you can start to glue the candles to the top of the candle holder. Now that we have completed the previous task, this should be your end result. Don't forget to start lighting your candles on December 26th. I hope you enjoyed my segment and stay tuned for more to come. Box of cans, there's two box of cans. The feelings is just amazing. Yes, it's time to live up my YouTuber dreams. Hello, my name is Taylor, and today I will be using my delightful school provided MacBook Air to discuss my thoughts on I, Tanya the 2017 film that stars Margot Robbie and details the story of Tanya Harding and its connection to the truth. If you haven't heard of the Tanya Harding story, she's a media personality and former figure skater who gained notoriety for an attack she had a prominent role in on fellow skater Nancy Kerrigan. The movie follows Harding's character throughout her life, leading up to the attack and its impact on her life after it took place. The movie contains subject matter surrounding topics like domestic violence, misogyny, and parental abuse, among others. One of the elements in I, Tanya I value the most is its dedication to accuracy. I value accuracy in a recreation of events more than anything, and the movie's efforts to make their scenes as close as possible to the actual recorded event is not lost at all on me. Some of the most interesting aspects depicted in the film are the dynamics between Tanya and those around her. One of the relationships that interested me the most in the movie is the one between Harding and her eventual husband, Jeff Galuli. The scene depicting the first time they met is shown directly after the scene of Harding's father leaving her behind, a clever foreshadowing to the destructive and codependent relationship that would follow as a result of these past events. Their relationship would prove to be extremely destructive. Harding reportedly filed for divorce two separate times, citing abuse allegations against Galuli. These abuse allegations are addressed heavily throughout I, Tanya, her manager. Jeff would oversee what Tanya would say to the press as well as control and finances. It's safe to say that Tanya's relationship with Jeff is just one example of her difficulty navigating adult relationships as a result of her father leaving her, as well as alleged years of abuse from her mother. There are multiple other examples of this lack of stability throughout I, Tanya, including the climax of the story and the reason why the movie was created, the 1994 attack on Nancy Kerrigan. The attack was shown at length in the movie. Although it was not done by Tanya herself, it was heavily debated that she took part in it. Some believe that she had no involvement or knowledge of the situation, while others see her as the mastermind behind the scheme. Tanya maintains that she did nothing wrong, though she eventually confessed that she had an inkling of the plan that was being discussed. The attack is another example of her relationship with Jeff Galuli, as well as how she was taught to handle issues in her life throughout various childhood experiences. Galuli is portrayed as the main coordinator of the events of the movie, which only further goes to show that he was in control of Tanya and the situation surrounding her. And although it was never proven that Tanya had any major role in the attack, it's important to realize that she and Kerrigan were something of rivals at the time. It was known to the public that the two were each other's main competition, so it wasn't surprising to hear that the attack was done with malicious intent and somehow involved Tanya. I knew that something was up. You never said to Jeff, let's do this. No. I did, however, overhear them talking about stuff where, well, maybe we should take somebody out so we can make sure she gets on the team. The raw look into her past, as well as the abusive nature of her relationships, 
makes it easy for me to believe that Tanya Harding had an extensive amount of knowledge pertaining to the attack beforehand, but that she wasn't entirely to blame for her lack of action. People in these relationships have warped perspectives. It's even easier for me to believe that she did feel that it was right to speak up, but that it would be too dangerous to admit. That, combined with the assumption that she would benefit from Kerrigan's injuries, really solidifies the situation in my eyes. My best guess is that she made the choice to let the attack happen under some duress. Of course, she's not blameless for the situation, and she did face the consequences. You believe that you were a pawn. Absolutely. And yet you paid the ultimate price. Yes, I did. After pleading guilty for a conspiracy to hinder prosecution, she was banned for life from professional skating and sentenced to three years probation and a $160,000 fine. But it's important to remember that the situation isn't black and white, nor is any. There's a lot that can be said about Tanya Harding, much more than I discussed in this video. So I highly recommend the movie I, Tanya, as well as a documentary that came out the year after entitled Truth and Lies, The Tanya Harding Story. And that's it for this video. Thank you for watching. Well, that's all there is for today. I hope you all have an amazing holiday season, and this is Anaya from BronxNet Open 2.0 signing off.